the Sustainability Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. The Stevens Institute of Technology is proud to present the Hugo New Corporation Sustainability Seminar Series, co-sponsored by Geocentic Consultants, H2M Architect Engineers, Brown and Codwell, and BEM Systems. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is exciting. Uh, I typically speak to undergraduate students, so uh, uh, this is this is a little new for us. And. Um, I want to thank Frank, who I met last year, Dr. Sakar, who uh, I also met last year, and our ambassador on campus, Lily, who is awesome. She did a tasting today outside of dining services um, on a coffee that we're actually going to talk about tonight, a farm that we're going to talk about tonight. So I, I, before I go into the presentation, and we are not this major firm, and I, I looked at some of the other uh, uh, sessions that you guys have had in municipalities, larger companies. We're a small company in Connecticut, um, but we're really trying to put our footprint uh, around the world uh, in helping people uh, with their lives and uh, through sustainability, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means in the coffee industry um, in a little bit. Uh, you don't have to know much about coffee or charts or finances or anything. Uh, this is a two-year futures chart for uh, December, of, uh, uh, December futures contract um, dating back basically two years ago. So you can see what the trend line is, and it doesn't look all that healthy. Um, so let's go into uh, this presentation. And again, I put this together. Usually I, I, I flip around from, um, from uh, page to page, but um, put this together so that we could, uh-oh. Uh let's try that again. Um, the the uh, the on on the, the the bottom axis is the is time, um, so in months, and on the, on the vertical axis is um, is dollars. So um, yeah, so so the price of coffee right now, uh, the, the December contract has actually rallied the last couple of days uh, because there were some uh, political issues going on in in Colombia, um, but. Uh, it's trading right around a dollar a pound. And a year and a half to two years ago, that, cost, it was, that was trading at, um, in, the $2, in the $2 range, $1.80 to $2 range. So um, let's give this one more shot. What happened? It was working perfectly. You don't think it's that, do you? No. Let me try without it then. This is not this is not a good omen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it must be the Dunkin' Donuts coffee that's up here right now. So, 
it is, that is not sustainable. They actually, 30%, they, their, their goal has been to get 30% of their coffee to be Rainforest Alliance certified. I suggest at some point, if you can, get on to the um, Rainforest Alliance website. Uh, it's uh, rainforestalliance.org, and uh, a really neat website. Um, so I'm going to keep talking while these guys are trying to figure this out. Um, so let me go to my slides, which you're not going to be able to see. I want to I want to just throw some numbers out so you guys get a general feel of what the coffee industry is all about and you know where where the people are and I call it the plight of the coffee farmer. Um, some statistics, just, just you're not not for you to memorize, but it'll, it'll give you an indication of a, a snapshot view of where we're at. 145 million bags of coffee are produced a year, in what we call the the, the coffee belt. Um, that equates to 21 billion pounds of coffee. And 80% uh, of that coffee is grown in small lot coffee farms. So a small lot coffee farm is, two, is a hectare of property or less, which is about two and a half acres. Um, so you, as you can see, of, of the 21 billion pounds, 16 billion of it is grown by families all over the world, small families all over the world. Um, it's 125 million people that actually base their lives on the coffee industry. Some of them are, har are, are farmers, some of them uh, work as harvesters, some of them work in the fertilization side, um, some work in the fin as a finishing agent uh, before coffee gets exported, but uh, that's all at origin. We're looking at 100, 125, million, uh, 125 million people. Um, Coffee production, if you do some research on it, has been linked to slavery, has been um, linked to child labor. 61% of coffee farmers are producing at a net loss, and they have been producing at a net loss for years. And it's, it's particularly bad right now. Um, I, thought he, I thought he had it. Um, Well, the, uh, produ producers equals growers. So when I say producers, I mean growers, I mean farms, family farms, okay? So 61% of all farms right now are underwater worldwide. And, that, and, and, and the, the micro farmer constitutes 80% of all production. So it just gives you an idea that it's, you know, talk about sustainability, not sustainable. I mean, long term, this is not sustainable. Um, they're financing, they're trying to just keep, make ends meet until they, 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 uh, uh, they get out of this pickle, if, if, if they ever do. Um, you go to Starbucks, you pay $2.50 for a medium-sized coffee, less than five cents of that coffee actually gets back to the farm. Oh, look at that. I don't know what you did, but don't move anything. Well, it's connected to his, but let's try out yours real quick. Average farmer age is 58 years old. So not only is it not financially sustainable at this point, the, the age of the farmer is getting up there and next generations aren't coming in because it's not uh, an entity that they really want to work in. Um, let's try that again. Okay, so again, 145 million bags, 21 billion pounds, 80% small lot micro farmers, 125 million people, uh, coffee production is linked to slavery and child labor. 61% uh, of coffee farmers are producing at a net operating loss. Five cents on a two dollar, less than five cents on a two dollar and fifty cent cup of coffee at most coffee shops, and most two fifty is actually a cheap price. Uh, I just had a coffee this morning in Manhattan. And it was I think three seventy five for a twelve ounce cup. Um, this gives you a like a forty year. Um, Snap a picture of, of, the, of the index of, of how coffee is traded on the, on the futures market. And you can see the huge volatility going on, high and low. Um, average cost of a farmer right now to produce coffee is um, about a dollar twenty, you know, worldwide, and it's different in Rwanda than it is in Sumatra, than it is in Peru and Guatemala. But if you take an average of everybody, it's right around a dollar twenty a pound. Um, Coffee's trading right now at a dollar a pound. The problem with this chart is that when there are peaks, 
the farmer never participates. The peaks, the futures traders on Wall Street participate. They're the ones that make, make the, the, the market move, and they're the ones that make the profits. And when there are valleys, guess who makes money? The futures market traders make, make money. They want volatility. If, you're, if you trade oil stocks, you trade gas futures, you trade coffee, um, orange juice, whatever, the, whatever commodity is being traded, the, 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 the actual traders themselves are looking for huge volatility because they can short the market, they can go long the market, that's how they make their money. Um, the, 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 the basis on the, on the coffee farmer is, has been kind of flatlined right around that dollar twenty over this cor course of this time. But that dollar, that dollar twenty, the, this this peak up here of three dollars and twenty-five cents isn't going back. So it's not like the farmer has a windfall profit for two years or three years because the market spiked to three dollars and twenty cents. But what Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and all the, the retailers are going to do is increase the price of their coffee, uh, of their their coffee, because they can justify it based on what the futures market is doing. Um, so coffee is grown in more than seventy countries. Uh, Sixty percent are from four countries, Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, and uh, Indonesia, uh, Sumatra primarily. Uh, Seventy percent is exported, and um, the, 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 the economies of coffee-rich countries, coffee-producing countries, really base their financials, their, their internal country financials, uh, for education, infrastructure, health, social services, on the revenue that, that actual coffee actually produces. Um, U.S. is the biggest importer. This is the coffee belt, um, north and south of the equator, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. And let's get into like a little bit of what, what you guys are involved in, that's sustainability, how we founded this company, um, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm even in this room. Because uh, sometimes I, I ask myself, is, am, I, am I really affecting people here? And are we, real, are, are, we know we're affecting farmers on the ground all over the world. Um, so the, our founding, uh, this is my uh, 1947 versus 2002. So about, uh, what, 17 years ago, sounds, feels like it was yesterday, but uh, uh, we, I, was, I had two roasting plants, I had a distribution warehouse, we were consolidating everything, everything, consolidating everything under one roof. We had built a new facility. And we're cleaning out the building of the company that I bought in 1990. And um, they brought invoices upstairs from the, the basement. And those invoices from 1947. And they were from Peru, Guatemala, Brazil, and Colombia. So I'm looking at these invoices in my left hand. And I've got invoices from the same countries, same regions in my right hand. And if I probably did enough homework, many of the same families two generations later, and there was a one cent difference in the price of the coffee. And up until that point, I was your typical, you know, white male privileged entrepreneur in the United States, making good money, had a good sized business. We were selling coffee up and down the East Coast, out to the Mississippi River. And um, I just cared about myself and my, our profits and what we were doing and how I could better you know, get the bigger house and buy the summer place and drive the Mercedes and, you know, send my kids to private schools and do all the stuff that you do with money. Um, I consciously chose to really never get to know the farmer and, like, what they were all about. I wanted the highest quality coffee I could buy at the lowest price I could pay so I could have the lowest cost of goods sold and I could make the biggest margin I could possibly make for the company. Um, so in 2002, I had this, you know, awakening, if you want to call it. We set up an LLC in 2008, uh, launched in 2010. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll get to, you know, I'll get to the launch in a second. Um, I knew at that point, and I, I really felt that I was doing, you know, I was doing the wrong thing. I mean, I was, I was taking advantage of people that I never got to know, um, living this great life, and I, I wanted to find out what what their lives were about. So I reached out to several farmers around the world, a few hundred actually, and um, there was a common denominator between all of them. And the first was living wages. Second was education for their children. My children, you were fortunate enough to get higher education, but at least 
we know in the United States you can get a high school education, um, you know, based on, the, on your, the town that you live in, it's, it's public education. Um, and uh, the third was uh, rainforest preservation because they saw a lot of clear cutting going on within the rainforest to grow coffee farms, to grow other uh, uh, agricultural products. So definition, Webster Dictionary, Google, I don't know where I got it. Uh, the ability to maintain at a certain rate uh, or level, avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. So when I talk to, uh, on campuses, I ask you know, a, a typical question of what, what's your definition of sustainability? And many students will talk about the environment, uh, recycling, composting, doing the right thing so the planet doesn't burn up, um, global warming, all completely valid and, and all really important. I kind of took a different look at the whole sustainability thing. And I, I came to a conclusion that without financial sustainability, all the other stuff's for naught. Because if you can't produce coffee in this industry at, at a profit to put food on the table for your family and clothes on your kids' back, get them educated, have health care, then you're going to close, leave the farm, you're going to go to Bogota or, or uh, Lima or whatever city is closest uh, to you, and you're going to drive a taxi cab, you're going to do something else, but you're not going to be growing coffee anymore. So we kind of base the whole company on financial sustainability with the, uh, the, 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 the earth, the planet, you know, as, as, as a secondary. Um, and we're, we're involved in both, but the, the, um, the financial side of it was the most important to me. Um, so the Golden Circle. Anybody ever heard of Simon Sinek? Anybody watch TED Talks? So I, when I, I was in um, my old company, I, it was the 2002, I had this, like, this awakening. Uh, I couldn't change the strategy of the business fast enough to be able to do what I wanted to do, and that's help farmers, because my customer base really didn't care about farmers either. So um, I ended up getting out. Um, I took four and a half years off. I went up to Boston to go back to school for a couple of years, because I, I wasn't smart enough to figure out how do you take an, a, a commodity-based business, and everything is a commodity. Your computers are commodities. The, the, the chairs that you're sitting on are commodities. Everything becomes commoditized over time. We're actually dealing in a commodity. So how do you take coffee, the second highest traded commodity in the world, to oil, and differentiate it, figure out how to help the farmers on, on, on one hand, and then figure out who your target market is and how you can penetrate that target market on the other hand, by the way, with limited funds. Um, so uh, I had the opportunity to, to get to uh, understand Simon, and he, um, he was an influence on me. He and one professor, strategy professor up at Harvard were, were like my two biggest influencers on the development of this. Uh, I want to play just five minutes of this. Um, it's a 17-minute video. He's got a couple really good ones. One's awesome on, on millennials, but this is, this is really the foundation, how I developed the strategy of this business. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. 
There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales are done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. 
The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision-making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you, um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permu same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts, because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight, and no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first, he didn't get rich, he didn't get famous, so he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 
two and a half percent of our population are our innovators. The next 13 and a half percent of our population are our early adopters. The next 34 percent are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> We all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, cl uh, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in, six, in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well-funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, knew, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own, and they told people. And some of those people uh, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 
250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed, and it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the Civil Rights Movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. So we came up with our golden circle. And Sun Coffee exists for three things. We exist to provide living wages for coffee farmers. We exist to educate children of coffee farmers, and that's through building schools, funding schools, helping finance schools. Um, and we believe in the preservation of the rainforest. So all our coffee farmers grow their coffee within the canopy of the rainforest. There is no clear cutting. This is our why. Our how, we'll get to in a second, but when we did a demographic study back you know, 12, 14 years ago, who aligned with us? And we reached out to over 2,000 people, all different, full scale on demographics, and it was the 18 to 30 year old male and female who were the conscious, who, who were the, the, the consumers with a conscience. They, they were the ones that were mission driven. They, they wanted to do good for people, for the planet. And there, were, there was a huge market that really didn't care. I didn't really care about that market because I wasn't gonna change that market. I wanted to target like a laser on the 18 to 30 year old male and female which brought me to the college and university market. And we focus strictly on colleges and universities, and that's it. Um, what's our differentiating proposition? All our coffees are certified. We do a lot of direct trade coffees. Uh, first thing we did is develop uh, a full syllabus. It's a 14-week course on sustainable and fair labor practices um, that's been used from Ivy League schools to community colleges. Uh, we have a student ambassador program, who Lily's our ambassador on campus, to involve students to talk about the farms and the farmers, not to promote Sun Coffee Roasters. A Nike ambassador will talk about Nike and how great their sneakers are. We really don't want to talk about Sun Coffee. We want to talk about the people that are providing coffee that you are supporting. And with your conscious decision to purchase that coffee or pour that coffee in dining, you are helping, helping a family in, in Nicaragua that we'll be sh uh, looking at shortly. Uh, we have student scholarships. We give financially back uh, to, um, to every school that we engage with. We've got about 20 some odd interns going on right now. Most of them are research based. Um, they do a lot of pro forma work. Uh, when we calculate the price of coffee with farmers, we don't look at that C market index. We don't care what the market's doing. Farmers, whether they're, they're a one acre or three acre farm, are running a business just like I run a business, like many of you guys will be running businesses or do run businesses currently. Um, they've got a cost of goods sold. They, 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 they never really figure it out. Uh, they don't have Excel spreadsheets and they can't you know, run a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement, 
that's what our interns are really helping them with. And we're developing a financial structure so that we know what an actual cost is. So even within like Columbia, for example, you know, Central Columbia versus Southern Columbia, the cost of production could range from $1.60 to $1.85. Uh, we do, do sustainability events, um, uh, we tell real stories about farmers that are on campuses. So I couldn't compete at our level with the big companies of the world. The, you know, the two big players in the college campuses were Pete's and Starbucks. And great companies, great coffee, nothing wrong with them. Um, but if we were going to uh, compete at their level, which is you know, great coffee, great service, great delivery, great marketing, we'd lose because they've got tons more money than we'll ever have. But if we could create something in our, uh, in our how that's very different, that's focused on this market, then maybe we, we would have a shot. And why nobody else is doing it, I'm not quite sure, but nobody else is doing it. Uh, there are a lot of companies that sell fair trade coffee and organic coffee and Rayforce Alliance coffee and shade grown coffee, but nobody has a program. When we talk to colleges and universities, Many times we start with a sustainability director on campus. We don't even talk to dining. Um, and then from there, we get introductions around campus because we want to involve students, we want to involve faculty, we want to involve uh, administrative people on campus to bring the whole group together to say, okay, we're all sitting on the same side of the table with the same value system, the same mission in mind to help these coffee farmers, these 125 million uh, people in the coffee industry around the world who are 60% underwater right now. We happen to sell great coffee. But you know what? That's not a differentiator either. You can get great coffee anywhere. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts, great coffee yeah, uh, uh, right here. Uh, I have some coffee for you guys to take home. We think that's great coffee too. So that, that really doesn't set you aside um, from any other company. Um, so farmer uh, financial sustainability, uh, uh, people in process. We're going to talk about a farm in Nicaragua. I'm going to actually go through some slides shortly. Um, the, the commitment to excellence from farmers, regardless of the size, is incredible. I mean, every bean is hand-picked. Um, very labor-intensive, cycle of poverty. Um, so environmental sustainability, rainforest preservation. So we, we support rainforest preservation in all the farms that we engage in, uh, engage with. Um, reforestation, um, we've worked with uh, Rainforest Alliance. Uh, to uh, facilitate reforestation, not just with coffee trees, but with, with other trees um, uh, uh, around the world. Um, natural fertilization, there's nothing, there's no, there are chemicals involved, uh, which is a health hazard for the farmer, uh, and it's not great for us in the, uh, on the consuming side. So everything that, that we purchase and we partner with uh, is, is using natural fertilization. Not all organic certified, because it's very expensive to be organic certified. USDA doesn't make it easy. Uh, so uh, the, the, it will, we'll show you how, what a natural fertilization looks like. Um, land use, um, everything is, is reused. The dead wood for heating and cooking. Um, uh, they grow fruit and vegetables to supplement um, uh, their diets. And um, then we're when we started the company, you know, we talk a great game, we engage with, with sustainable, sustainable farmers, and we try to help them in financial sustainability and, and environmental sustainability. Well, what are we going to do? So we have um, a very unique roaster. There were seven built in the world. Six are in Tokyo. We have the seventh. Uh, our, our roaster runs at about 300,000 BTUs of natural gas an hour. Any roaster similar in size is running close to 3 million BTUs of natural gas an hour. So significantly less uh, fuel consumption on, on our roaster. We have zero emissions. Byproduct of roasting is smoke. And um, 28 particulates per thousand uh, is the EPA regulation. Uh, if you, most coffee roasters will have an afterburner, and that means they'll heat the smoke up to about 16, 1700 degrees, try to burn the particulates out, but you can't get less than 10%. I mean, it's impossible. So um, we had these catalytic cleaners develop, and we have zero emissions. Um, much more expensive, but the right way to do it. Uh, a byproduct of roasting also is, is chaff. 
which is like the uh, flaky thing in the middle of popcorn that you, you know, you see. It's, 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 technically, it's popcorn, but it's really not. Um, we get bag full of that every single day. We have free range chicken farmers come and pick it up. And instead of cutting trees down and, and using wood chips with the chicken farms, they use the chaff instead. Uh, we recycle all the burlap bags, which is what the, the coffee comes in from all over the world. And we uh, recycle our corrugated. And we put it in the right bin, too. So I think we're good, Frank. Um, we have a solar project going. Uh, we've identified um, our, our, um, uh, CO, our carbon footprint. Um, we're oversizing solar panels so that we can compensate for the natural gas that we use. Uh, goal is solar, sun solar by 2020. So sometime in the middle of this coming year, uh, we'll be completely off the grid and actually overproducing um, uh, uh, electricity to compensate for the natural gas that we're burning. Um, and it, so, so we want to be carbon neutral by the end of the year, uh, by the end of 2020. So let's put that in like real terms, okay? And the only way I can do it is to show you some slides and show you real farm um, and how not only do we work with the financial sustainability side, which I'll keep saying because like that's to me, one of the most important things, um, but also the environmental sustainability. So in Nicaragua, this is one of the first farms that we, we engage with. It's actually a slightly larger farm, but they do some really cool things with engaging with the 2,000 micro farmers in their area. Um, and we'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, in Otega and Matagalpa are the two. Anybody been to a coffee farm, by the way? No? OK. I'll give you a free bag of coffee if you were. Um, uh, so Inotega and, and Matagalpa are in the northern region of Nicaragua, very rich soil, volcanic soil, uh, great for growing, high elevations. Um, flew into Managua the first time, drive into Inotega, and I see these red buildings everywhere. And I mean, literally hundreds of them. Um, and it was, you know, like a 200 kilometer drive. Um, they're coyotes. So what's a coyote? Um, you know, before this, I did all this learning of coffee, which was kind of embarrassing after I'd been in it for 15 years. Um, you know, I thought coyotes are human trafficking. You know, you hear about it now, you know, come the, the Hondurans and Guatemalans coming over the border and truck, tractor trailers, coyotes, right? Uh, in the coffee industry, one of the biggest problems the coffee farmers have is logistics, how to get coffee to market. So once coffee's harvested, you have a 48-hour window to get that coffee to the finishing agent for export. Coffee has to be cleaned, has to be dried, has to be bagged. If you don't hit that 48 hour window, the coffee ferments. The closest beneficio, which is the finishing agent, could be 50, 60, 70 kilometers away. Some have mules, some don't. Even with a mule, you're not gonna get three or four bags of coffee that you harvested today, 70 kilometers, and then, and then back again. So, these coyotes are set up everywhere, and it's not just Nicaragua, it's every coffee producing country in the world. And they will go, what's your name? Kristen. Kristen. So Kristen's our coffee farmer. She just harvested three bags today. Uh, she knows that the coffee's high quality. It's an 18 screen, Nicaraguan from Inotega. Uh, it's cupping in an 85, all this technical stuff. And um, Kristen needs to sell the coffee. Coffee in the, in the open market should be going for $1.50, $1.60 a pound for, 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 uh, for, per, per pound for that coffee. Um, but she has no way to get it to the beneficio. So the, t the clock's ticking. So Kristen has to make a decision because I'm the coyote and I come up to Kristen. I say, you know, Kristen, I know you've got a great crop. You've always grown great coffee. Um, you've got three bags. I will offer you 28 cents. Now you have to make a decision. Are you taking the 28 cents or not? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. You, have to, you, yeah. you basically have to because if you don't take the 28 cents, you get nothing. Right. Right, because that coffee is going to ferment. Once it ferments, even one bean ferments in a 200-pound bag of coffee, the whole lot is shot. So you're going to take basically what they give you. There's no negotiating. And some days they may feel great and they'll give you 32 cents. But for the most part, you're going to get pennies on the dollar for what your coffee really should get. Is that financially sustainable? No. So logistics is, is, is a big part of, of what's going on, and a big part of the issue 
of coffee farmers worldwide. And like I said, it's not just Nicaragua, it's every coffee producing so country in the world. Um, excuse me? The, is there a problem? Right. Yeah, there's a huge problem. I mean, there, there's. Well, 70 kilometers you can do in like an hour, right? I mean, or, or less in, in, a, in a vehicle. But you, you can't put it on your back and carry it. Right. You can't put it on a mule and bring it in a, in a mule. So. Transportation is a huge problem, and, and it's something that we've worked on a little bit, but it, 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 you can't, we can't do everything. So, you know, the, to, what, the reason, one of the reasons we connected with this farm, and this is a slightly larger farm, they've got about 700,000 trees on this farm, which it sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. 500,000 are producing coffee, 200 are in years one to three, which they're not producing coffee yet. Um, they have one truck. There's 2,000 micro farms around this farm. The family that owns this farm allow all the micro farmers to use their one truck to get coffee to the beneficio, which in this case is about 30, 35 kilometers away. Um, so they, they, they work and they also have an education program to help increase their yields and their quality. So this particular farm, like I said, is larger than any other farm that we engage with, but they're doing the right thing by the micro farms in, in their community. And, um, and we buy from all the farms, all the micro farms as well as this particular farm. They have a constitution. So I went there the first time. This was several years ago. Um, you know, right of free religion, um, organization. Um, and this is what a typical farm looks like that we engage with. That's the canopy of the rainforest. Within that canopy is where the coffee is grown. It's rough terrain. I mean, there could be uh, hills that are 45, 50 degree hills. Um, when you're, they're harvesting coffee, they'd be hanging off a tree with a rope, uh, picking one cherry at a time. This picture is, shows you a red a, a cherry. It's a fruit. Coffee's a fruit. Uh, within the cherry are two beans, typically. Um, you can see this honey finish here. That's what has to be cleaned, dried, and then the chap, there's a skin on it that you really can't see here, but that has to be taken off um, before it gets exported. Uh, from the time, if you were to plant this seed, the time you get your first leaf to the time it yields its first bean of coffee is three years. So in a typical life of a coffee tree is between 18 and 20 years, proper pruning and fertilization. So, so farmers are constantly planting new trees because they know that there's a, there's a wait time of three years before it yields any product. That's what the center of the, of the cherry looks like. And actually the cherry is very sweet, it tastes delicious. Um, is uh, planting seedlings. Uh, this is like a one-year-old tree. Um, so I kind of like this picture because this shows you um, what a, a branch looks like during harvest. So what happens is uh, in harvest in Nicaragua is between the middle of November and the middle of March. It's a four-month harvest. Um, you'll see uh, 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 the tree will flower. Then you'll get a, um, uh, a green bean. Green will turn yellow, yellow will turn red. Only the red cherries get harvested. So Frank's our picker, okay? And Frank, we bring Frank into the rainforest. Uh, he's hanging from a tree, uh, picking one cherry at a time in an area about half the size of this room. And he's there from six in the morning to six o'clock at night. That's all he does. Um, again, only picking the red cherries. Two, two weeks later, Frank goes back to the same area, picks the next round of red cherries because they will ripen at different times. And like I said, it takes four months for all the coffee, all the cherries to, to, to ripen on one tree. Two weeks later, Frank goes back again. Four months to pick all the red cherries off of one coffee tree by hand in the rainforest, really tough conditions yields one pound of coffee. When you crunch the numbers, which I have, it's literally billions and billions of man hours. It's mind boggling. When you think about the technology and the oil industry, which is the highest traded commodity, you know, refining and, uh, and fracking and, and deep water drilling and you know, uh, uh, freight, uh, uh, ocean freight to bring oil over, 
or export oil, um, very automated. The second highest traded commodity in the world, which is coffee, is not automated at all. There's some macro farms in Brazil and a few in Colombia uh, that will have some automation. But as we said earlier, 80% of all coffee is harvested like this, one bean at a time. Just the coffee that's sold on this campus is thousands of man hours. Take everybody's personal consumption in this room, and then look at Hoboken, look at New Jersey, start looking at the country. It's, it, they're crazy numbers. Um, that's, that's a picture of somebody during, during harvest. Uh, this is Maria. So I got to meet Maria after a 12-hour, 10, 12-hour day. She had picked this sack of coffee. Um, she'd walked about a mile from where she was to the centralized location where everybody gathers to pool the coffee to go to market on their one truck. She spent about an hour with me talking about, you know, I, I want to know about her life. I want to know what her, you know, what, what, what was good, what was bad, what were the needs. And the first thing I did was, let me help you with the bag. And I took this bag and I put it on my shoulders and I tried to walk from here to that door and I couldn't do it. That's a 200 pound bag of coffee. She probably weighs 120, 130 pounds. I mean, it was, and, and from where she came from, it makes it even more insane, right? I mean, she, it, she, she had walked through, you know, the jungle, basically, to get to this centralized location after a 10, 12-hour day, and she had a smile on her face, and she was happy to sit down and talk to me for an hour about her family, her two children, uh, her husband who works there, the living wages that she's getting, actually three times living wages on this particular farm, um, and, and how she, there's food on the table and her kids are being educated. So she was, like, so happy. And I mean, I, all I could think of is I've had a lot of employees in the past. There's a lot of complaining going on that, you know, it's, it's cold outside. I don't want to come to work today, right? Um, so I, it, it really brought a whole new vision for me on who the people are behind the coffee that we all kind of take for granted. Um, this was another gentleman that I had met. And... Um, he was the number one picker on this farm, 28 years in the running. And they, they get compensated based on volume. So, you know, he, again, he spent an hour with me after we, after we uh, met, and he was finished with work during the day. And I said, you know, what's with the hands? And he said, I have carpal tunnel in both my hands. And I'm like, okay. So... Can it be surgically repaired? I mean, do you have health? He said, yes, the family that owns the farm would pay for me to be surgically repaired. I couldn't pick coffee for a full year. And when I come back, I don't know that I could still be the number one picker on the farm. I'm like, okay. He said, by the way, look at my hands. They're in perfect shape, because he couldn't straighten his hands out. Perfect shape to be able to pick coffee cherries. And then all I could think of was OSHA and workman's comp and, again, all the stuff that we deal with here, which is, you know, all legitimate organizations, right? But they don't think about it that way. They don't think about life that way. They don't think about – they take such pride in every single cherry that they pick and the work that they do, and none of us really know it here in the States, really worldwide. But in particular, since we're the number one consuming, you know, purchaser of coffee worldwide – very few people in the States really know what's going on behind the cup that they're drinking. Um, and there he is. So at the end of the day, everybody centralizes. Some of these are farm workers for uh, the, this particular farm. Some of them are micro farmers that are in the surrounding community. Um, coffee gets put in these, uh, in these five gallon buckets um, and then brought down with the one truck that they have to this uh, processing area. The only automation this farm has is this, and it's all it is, it's very simple. It's a screw conveyor, and it's designed to take the skin off of the cherry. Um, and a lot of water is used. All the water is natural water from the mountain. Um, and you can see the, the auger turning, and when it turns, the skins get cut off, and a lot of water is being used goes into these holding tanks where they continue to spray it down to take that honey finish off because that, that's essential to, to the coffee not fermenting. 
Um, and you can see the, the honey there. Uh, and then this is their high tech, you know, for you engineers, this is their high tech cleaning process before it goes to the beneficio. Uh, rock embedded in cement. And then they rush water with the coffee over this rock cement structure that they built to scrape off as much of the, of the honey as they can uh, before they bag the coffee and send it to the beneficio. Coffee goes here, scooped up, then the skins go another direction. So these are the skins from, the, from today's production and they put them in a pile and on the left hand side you see them darker, these are the older skins, uh, they're starting to age and then the fresh skins on the right hand side. Um, they take the skins, they have a room that's about the size of this room with these three foot channels. Uh, they take the, the, the skins, they introduce earthworms to them. I don't know much about earthworms, but I know that they live for about 30 days, they die, they, you know, excrement, they die, and then, the, you know, new, new worms come, pop up. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll create fertilization with the skins. 700,000 trees, remember what I said earlier, all hand-packed twice a year in the rainforest with this product, their, their fertilization. They actually, they, they, I, the first time I tried it, which was actually about a year and a half ago in Papayan, Colombia, they took the skins and they made a juice and it was absolutely delicious. And I've been trying to get them to export it to us because there's nothing like it in the States. It's got a very different taste. It's sweet and it's really good, but it's not like a, you know, like a punchy type sweet. It's red. It's, it's really, really good. It could be a valuable... Yeah, absolutely. And th this one... Cooperative in Colombia is actually producing it for you know in in country sales, They're, and they have no preservation. So the life of the product, because it's, it's all natural, is maybe 30 days. So it's not shelf stable. Uh, yeah, I mean they they. I don't know that much about the juice end of what they do, but it could be a way for them to diversify to increase the revenue and, and make their farms more profitable or make them profitable, never mind more profitable. So coffee goes into these ponds. There are three ponds in this particular farm. Not potable, you can't drink it, but you could use it for irrigation. So they put a, uh, a bioenzyme and introduce it to the pond. They take the, 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 the water from this pond with a one horsepower pump bamboo shoots, okay, there's no hoses, uh, they shoot the, the, the water up about a thousand feet into the mountain and then through bamboo shoots irrigate the, the plants in a particular region. So they'll, use, they'll reuse all this water and, and recycle the mountain water for, uh, for uh, watering purposes for the, the plants. There's reforestation areas going on everywhere, um, they're replanting trees, not just coffee trees but, but uh, several varieties. Um, during off season, which is you know the middle of March, uh, April, uh, until the next harvest, um, they will um, uh, they'll cut dead wood for cooking. So now the coffee gets to the benefit.
rushing it because Samir told me I only have a few minutes left. Um, to me, this is what it's all about. And, you know, yeah, we've got to get that financial picture in, in a healthy format, and we've got to make sure that these farmers are making money so they are sustainable and they can grow coffee year after year after year. Um, but without the next generation coming in, it's all for naught. So these children have a thirst for knowledge just like any other child in the world that, that has, is more privileged than, than these children. And they have a schoolhouse that they, that they built. They have one teacher. This is a K to five school. We helped fund a van to get the children to the Enotega, which is about 20 kilometers away, uh, to get them further along in education. Uh, this is sixth, through high, sixth grade through high school. Um, but they're just, they're, they're, they're respectful. They have a thirst for knowledge. And, uh, and they, they, they know the opportunity that they're given because many of their friends in the surrounding communities don't have this opportunity. Um, we always have a big party, and I won't get into all the details here. This is a preschool that we helped fund because one of the, the things that they identified was the fourth grader was staying home with a three-year-old because both parents were working the harvest. So we, they, they found a building. We helped outfit the building. Uh, they hired the staff, and now all children are being taken care of through fifth grade. Um, you look at their faces, uh, I melt when I look at them. Uh, this guy saw a sticker for the first time in his life, popped it on his face, sat next to his big sister, and you know, and, and that was gratifying for me. It sounds a little corny, but it was just like really cool. Um, this one thought I was a space alien because I was like a foot taller than everybody else, and she gave me that look for about an hour. So she got her goodie bag and her punch, and then she like warmed up to me a little bit. Um, this is our plant. Um, this is the roast that I talked to you about with the, the very low burn rate on natural gas. Um, it's a very unique roaster. These are our catalytic cleaners. Um, so we're trying to live a sustainable lifestyle ourselves. And uh, this is a, 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 very high, a very efficient water-cooled grinder, which maybe a dozen in the U.S. right now. Um, and then some packing equipment, and that is it. So um, did I make my five minutes? All right. Um, so I, I, I don't know if, you know, I know I've seen some of these other podcasts, whatever you guys call this, uh, and they were, you know, about recycling, you know, for Hoboken, and they were about a major, you know, company that, that produces electricity or, or re, you know, the composting. Um, we touch all that, but we really want to be about the lives of the farmers, and we want to make sh sure that whoever we engage with can continue to do the thing that they love to do. They're doing it now, losing money. I can't even imagine if they could make money, how much, you know, what, what difference that would make in, in, in their lives. So uh, with that, I will take any questions you have. Um, and thank you.